You're listening to the Off Track Podcast with Cornelius Lysett and Martin Dwyer. Just to warn you, there are adult themes and some swearing in this podcast. If you're potentially offended by that, then please uh, look elsewhere. There are plenty of other fine racing podcasts around uh, and you can sling your hook over there. Welcome to the Off Track Podcast with Martin Dwyer and Cornelius Lysett. Well, there's a, there's a combo to conjure with. I know a lot of people are surprised in racing at how well we get on and about our relationship, which uh, I'm making it sound a bit weird, but um, yeah, I don't know why. Why are people so surprised? Uh, yeah, hmm. I, I suppose I'm, I'm, I represent the media. You're a jockey. Once upon a time, jockeys in the media probably, you know, the era of, of Piggott and, and Eddery and Willie Carson when he was a jockey, etc. I'm not sure uh, the jockeys were mad about the media, to be honest. Really? I just thought it was because you were a tough. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a toughie. <laughs> <laughs> no, I suppose we are on different sides of the fence, but um, yeah, we've, we've always got on, haven't we? And, and genuinely, it does surprise people. We, but we've got a lot in common. Yeah, well, the, the mighty, the great game, uh, the great game of, of horse racing. I've, I was trying, on the way here, I was trying to remember encountering you for the first time. And I can't, I can't remember an incident. But you must have been, you were apprentice, weren't you, to Ian Balding? Yeah, well, obviously you were, you were. I was apprentice to Ian Balding. You were an owner at the time, part owner, and a couple of shares, friend, and friend of the Baldings. And uh, I remember I'd be working pretty hard, and uh, see you waltz in the yard, looking very <laughs> posh. And I used to think, who's this fella? Must be some lord or, or such <laughs> like. And then I got to ride a few horses for you, didn't I? And um, and then I think you were slagging me off one day, that, and then I got your phone number. And that's how it started, wasn't it? Yeah, I I do remember the I I, I do remember the slagging off incident. Um, <laughs> and now it hasn't stopped. Uh, it hasn't stopped ever since. You are listening to Off Track with Martin Dwyer and Cornelius Lysett. So what was the horse called that I rode for you? That was when you you were slagging me off to Chris Anstar. Connor. Anstar. Anstar. It was at Leicester. Uh, and. Uh, Almost uh, a few years ago now. Well, I just looked it up. I was going to go for about 2000, <laughs> 2003, 4 or 5. 1999. I, I suppose the biggest shock there is that Martin Dwyer was riding as a jockey before the turn of the century. Jesus Christ, that makes us both feel old. Yeah, half your opponents now weren't even born at the turn of the century. So, um, this podcast, was it your idea? I don't know, I thought it was your idea. All oh, right. Well, maybe it was both our ideas. Let's go for that. Both our ideas. So what is to try and give a slightly different uh, uh, different perspective, isn't it? Yeah, I reckon um, we've both been in this game many years now, over 20. Uh, we've both got many shared experiences and we probably look at it from, from a different angle. So um, let's get our heads together and see if we can uh, come up with something and make it maybe a little bit informative. And good to, to to react to what's going on in the world but also to reflect on some stories from yesteryear and I'll tell you what the big change to my mind which you've ridden through the biggest change I've worked through the biggest change to in many ways to racing in the modern era was Sunday racing didn't used to really be big at all uh, and it's obviously gradually got bigger and bigger so as a result Saturday nights Saturday nights used to be the fun night of the week, didn't they? Well, that's the thing. You know, I, I, I was thinking about it. I don't know whether the younger generation of jockeys today, I don't know why it's maybe why some of them keep getting into so much trouble because I don't think they have enough downtime, um, which, you know, in my early career, you know, as you say, we didn't race every Sunday and we had, we had plenty of downtime. <laughs> and um, a lot of that downtime was spent here in the Queens. We had some great parties. In Your the office. Past. Yeah, one, <laughs> one of the many offices. But it, it always sounded better, didn't it? I'll meet you in the office instead of I'll meet you in the pub. And you actually used to live only a few hundred yards away from the um, from the Queen's Arms at East Garston, give it a plug, uh, your, your office. And um, uh, I remember the menu at your... <laughs> at, your, the, at the cottage where you lived, uh, there was only sort of there, there was there was only one real choice on the menu, wasn't there? That's a lie. It wasn't one choice. So I lived just down at my first ever house down down on the corner there in East Garston, and uh, you stayed over a few times. And I think one one day we woke up on a Sunday with a hangover and there wasn't much food in, so I gave you a pot noodle and you were just astounded. You're like, oh my god, what's this? What's this ghastly stuff? And then you loved it. Pot noodles. Yeah. Oh, it was so straightforward, wasn't yeah. it? Pouring the 
Was that, was that you opening your wallet or what? <laughs> it was quite. I think I think you need your fan belt looking at <laughs> um, uh, Sarah or Madam driving that car. Gosh, that is quite annoying. Have you eaten a pot noodle since? Uh, not since you moved out of Pot Noodle. I, I called it Pot Noodle Cottage, <laughs> didn't did, I? Actually, yeah. yeah. When I drove by it earlier, it brought back many, many memories. But they were great times, weren't they? This, this pub was heaving on a Saturday. All of racing, all of racing fraternities used to come here. We used to have some great parties, many great stories. Um, yeah, I don't know. Did a younger generation trainers job? Do they do enough of that now? Or? Do they have as much fun? So I, I went to a race meeting the other day at Perth in Scotland, which, when I was quite a lot younger, was the best three days of the year, without question. And to be perfectly honest, one day did me perfectly well this year. Uh, and they, it used to be racing in the afternoon, out on the town in the evening. I just, do you think, well, you, you, you know, you're one of the senior riders and you see the junior jockeys, do you think they have as much fun? Like, I don't know, that's the thing. I, I think there's a lot more pressure on them now, what with social media and all this sort of bollocks. And nobody seems to do anything without filming it or putting it somewhere. So, <laughs> well, well imagine actually some of those Saturday nights in here. We won't name any names, but there were champion jockeys, there were well-known jockeys, there were well-known jump jockeys, there were well-known flat jockeys, there were senior jumps trainers, there were all sorts in there. Funny enough, there's a trainer in the pub today. I'm not going to name any names. <laughs> but there's a trainer in the pub today, and I have such a clear recollection of last time I saw him in this pub. He came in quite late, um, and uh, I, I quite fancy myself on the old quiz machines. You were probably trying to have a fight with someone in the corner, but I was being a bit more cultured uh, <laughs> on the quiz machine. And do you remember those quiz machines? You used to build up, you sort of build up your potential winnings. So you started, mm. you could win a pound, then you could win a fiver, then you got to a tenner, and I think the maximum was 20. So if you answered enough questions, you were suddenly earning, in danger of, uh, of um, winning, say, 20 quid and so you were on 18 pounds and this trainer who I won't name who's in the pub as we sit here now ex-trainer actually he came in one day he lurched in with a, a former jump jockey a former flat jockey uh, lurched in they they possibly had a couple elsewhere they saw me at the machine and they came over and the trainer leant down and he turned it off at the mains and so all my all my winnings are gone. Oh, I was. How many questions did you get right to get to twenty quid? Oh, I think. Well, it was. I think I was sort of on the cusp of twenty quid. So I was probably on about Two seventeen quid. So I probably answered about thirty. To be fair. I think that's a slight exaggeration. Not like you, you to exaggerate. The, the, those quiz machines. Do you remember those quiz machines? Yeah. They used to be such good fun. Um, but uh, no, the the parties. I remember. Oh, you know, endless parties here. Um, I do remember another uh, another jockey who again another jockey who remained nameless who I think was showing a bit too much interest in your girlfriend and you took uh, a bit of a, you took a bit of a view <laughs> in here. I remember and then you that. that up. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, he remembers to this day. I, uh, you know, I always thought you know. You interviewed him not long after, didn't you? Well, I, I interviewed him subsequently. What did he call me? He called him. <laughs> what did he call me? <laughs> he called that. That shit bag Dwyer. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't saying that when I had him stuck to the wall in the toilet. <laughs> uh, because it, although some of you flat jockeys may not be very tall, that doesn't uh, that doesn't preclude you from being quite tough. Well, I don't know about that. If you put on a good a good enough show, hopefully they'll, they'll back off. Yeah, but uh, so what? So you know, we're talking about how well we weren't, but we're going to now about how you sort of got into the whole thing. So you 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 grew up in Liverpool. Yeah. So you should really have been playing football for, for Everton or indeed for another side in that area. But you, you didn't and you ended up a jockey. How did that all happen? I know, that's, it's been well documented, hasn't it? I was, well, I grew up on a council estate, uh, fell in love with horses, just wanted to wear with horses. And um, my dad was a big racing fan, wasn't he? You know my dad, you met him many times. And um, he wrote a letter to Ian Bolden and the rest is history, as they say. I mean, you're, I know what you're coming up next, that, your favourite story. This is my favourite. The hounds. So, Oh, no, no, not that. Uh, no, I was thinking earlier than that. When when Ian Balding supposedly said to you, "What connection have you had? With, <laughs> <laughs> do you have with well, racing?" That was one of you lot in the press. Somebody, I'd had a few rides, hadn't I? And somebody said, uh, "With the name Dwyer, are you, have you got links with racing? Have you got family in racing?" And I said, um, "Thinking you were Irish." <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I said, um, "Yeah, no, my dad had his bike nicked alongside the bookies once. <laughs> that was as, as close as it got." But um, yeah, I thought you were going to start talking about the hounds. You still. Still going about so, that. So, so it is a good story. You are going to tell it. Um, so, when you were at King, so we're in the 1990s. Yeah. Uh, and the 
apprentice, in inverted commas, apprentice academy that Andrew Balding runs now was sort of going in those days as well, wasn't it? Pro well, probably it was not quite as big as, as nowadays. I don't know. We had a, Ian. Ian was the original master. He had a, he, when I was there, it was 10, 12 apprentice jockeys. Right. So name some, name some other names. Oh, Seamus O'Gorman, David Griffiths, who's training now, um, Francis Arrowsmith. He was from Liverpool as well. He rode Locks On, do you remember? Yeah. Well, Won the Air Gold Cup on Locks On. And she, because Willie Carson, who, was it Willie Carson? Yeah. Willie Carson. Who'd been friend. riding her, but he had to go to Newbury that day for someone else, didn't he? For Sheikh Hamdan, probably. Did he? I thought he was just, um, he was claiming off her. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so it was a, no, it was, it was a big thing back, at, back then to be an apprentice. Not like now. You didn't swan about with your wash bag and in and out of the races. You had to graft. So did you not have a Mercedes in those days? No, I didn't. I had a push bike and a... A little clapped out old Peugeot. <laughs> <laughs> Did it get to? Would it get you to the races? Eventually, yeah. Yeah. Eventually, yeah. I've gone back to the. Yeah, you want me to tell the story? Yeah, now yeah. So, 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 you do that, you. Don't you? You, you, you professional broadcasters. <laughs> 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 what? Uh, so, what? What? Just what's the context of the dog story? I'd only been. I'd left home, left uh, Merseyside, left the council estate. Moved down to Berkshire, Royal Berkshire, where they all speak a bit like you. And um, it was just like an alien environment to me. And it was only the second weekend I was there and Ian Baldwin said, right, you're going to come hunting with me on Sunday. I was like, shit, hunting? I, was, I haven't even got a red jacket. So I didn't have a clue what it meant, but it was drag hunting. So where the um, so there's no foxes, but you lay a scent with a, a sock and a, and a bit of rope and a big canister, big... Um, canister of well, I don't know what it was, but it stung to high heaven. Was Scent. It, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Someone said it was foxes piss, but how would you get piss out of a fox? How would you do that? I don't, don't think. I'd, I think that's physically. You'd have to catch it first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so anyway, he took me to. Uh, it was the back of Highclere Castle. It was stunning. And then he dropped Downton me Abbey. Off, yeah, Downton Abbey. And uh, with a piece of paper, it was a map and um, this pissy sock and a canister full of stuff. Were you on your own? Yeah, mm. and uh, you set off like an hour before the hounds and the and the riders, and then he said, just just run round, follow this map, lay the scent, and then and you'll be all right. So this would take you about two hours, and uh, he dropped me there, and off you go. He started pissing down with rain. It was freezing cold. The map disintegrated in my hands, and I'm wandering round bloody the back of Highclere with uh, holes. I had holes in my trainers. And it was freezing, and I'm just wandering around. I got lost, didn't know what was happening. Next thing you know, I'm over this hill, and I'm looking up here. <laughs> and all these dogs come over the hill, and I'm like, Jesus Christ. And they're obviously running everywhere I'd been. And they're coming closer and closer. Said, Fuck this. So I climbed up a tree, right? So I climbed up this tree, dropped this stuff at the bottom, and I'm sat on a branch, and they all come to the bottom of the tree, going mental, trying to get up at me. And I'm there shitting myself. And then they galloped over all the toffs, and Ian Bowden, Ian, Ian being was one there, of and all the other toffs, all the fellas, and they're like, what are you doing up there, boy? And I went, fucking hell, the dogs are going to get me. And they're going, get down. I said, I'm not coming down until the dogs are gone. And then this other fella said to me, they're not dogs, boy. I thought, Jesus Christ, <laughs> they don't even know what a dog is down here. Like, where I'm from, dog's sake, so you climb on a garage roof or somewhere, and the bus stop till they've gone. So I'm just stuck in this tree, and I'm thinking, this, oh, this. eventually they went off, and I came down and walked home and met Ian Baldwin later on, and he took me back, and he was all right, he was all right about it. Um, but I, I rang my dad that night, I said, Dad, I don't think this place is for me. I said, they're all a bit nuts, they don't even know what a dock is down here. <laughs> so, um, but I, I hated every minute of doing them drag hunts, but I had to do it every other weekend. What, this this trail? Yeah, to, different places, but it was hard work, it really was. But. That was my introduction to uh, to uh, life in uh, Royal Berkshire. Funnily enough, I did an interview not long ago with Harry Skelton when he was champion jump jockey. And uh, he was sitting underneath this picture of dogs. And I said, um, he said, everything okay? It was on Zoom. He said, everything okay? You know, can you, you see it all sort of framed or whatever the professionals call it. And I said, yeah, and, and, your, and, your do and, and he had the, the, the dogs were up above. I said, the dogs look good as well. And he said, a bit like your man, he said, they're not dogs, they're hounds. So why did they uh, get so offended, though? I mean, same thing, isn't it? Well, I suppose, yeah, uh, well, I suppose it's a bit like, do you like it when, when horses are called nags? You know, it's a bit dismissive, but I suppose. That's derogatory, isn't it? But 
I don't know, it was a dog same thing. I mm. don't know. Did you never go hunting? No, d d absolutely not, not. Not not really very horsey. For not that sort of horsey. So why did you get into racing? That uh, I, if I'm brutally honest, it was an attraction to my family that the racecourse bars stayed open all afternoon and <laughs> ordinary pubs didn't, because uh, pubs pubs only opened all day from the early to mid 1980s. So Did before it? that, yeah, they closed at half past two, as as plenty still do today. But but you know all pubs half past two, and and they shut. Right. Uh, but racecourse bars stayed open all afternoon, and um, some in my family found that quite an attractive trait of going to the races, and they were into it as well. So how so did you get into broadcasting? Like the sound of my own voice. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd get there before you said it. <laughs> voice <for> radio. <laughs> yeah. But you went, you went to Eton, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the, who, who, Ed, um, who's the trainer in Ireland? Who does what? Who, who the story about you? Oh, oh right. Well, come okay. on, tell us that story. Edward O'Grady. Edward O'Grady. Come on. So Edward O'Grady, who was my, uh, he remains one of my absolute heroes, and Edward O'Grady, he's been training since the mid seventies, and uh, <laughs> he says uh, he said to, uh, I got to know him, and to, to, this was, um, you know, in my earlyish working days, and I, I thought, I, you know, it's Edward O'Grady. Gosh, this is quite exciting. <laughs> And then he, he called me Eamon. So I got to know him a bit better. And he said, hi, Eamon, one day at Leopardstown. And I thought, I think he's just called me, I think he's just called me Eamon, but I'll let that go. You know, he's a hero of mine. <laughs> and then he said it again. Hi, Eamon, how are you doing? This was at Aintree the second time. And I thought, I'm going to have to say something. So I said to him, actually, my, my name's not uh, Edward, it's not Eamon, it's Cornelius. And he said, yeah, I know it's Cornelius. And I said, yeah, but you keep calling me Eamon. He said, uh, knock, knock. And so I said rather warily, who's there? He said, Eamon. Eamon who? Eamon Old Etonian. <laughs> Which he <laughs> thought was absolutely. It's not that funny, is it? But he thought it was absolutely. And remains to this day still think it's absolutely that's... hilarious. Somebody else told me that. You kept on quiet. Did you laugh at the time or did you get stroppy? No, I didn't get stroppy. It was quite. It was quite funny. It, in fact, it was more than quite funny. It was very funny. But um, when you went to uh, Eton, yeah, did you did you have to attend lectures in um, in how to communicate with common people like me? Uh, if I said yes, did I do well? If I said no, are you impressed? <laughs> Go on, surprise me. Uh, no, I'd, no. Do, do you know? Being serious for a moment, I not long after leaving Eton because I'd been at boarding schools from the age of eight to 17 and a half all boys boarding schools and uh, two of them and uh, I was at somewhere called the National Broadcasting School which is where you learn to be a broadcaster um, looking at some of the broadcasters around today it'd be quite useful if it was still around but uh, anyway that's another story <laughs> uh, and the National I remember sitting in a classroom at the National Broadcasting School having a lecture on whatever and suddenly realizing that this was the first time since my primary school, so I was about 18 at the time, first time since I was at primary school that A, I'd sat in the same class as any, uh, any uh, women, uh, and B, of anyone who, um, who didn't come from a similar type of background to me. So it was something to really embrace. And the BBC was a great organization to work for, because although there is an element of rah-rah public school boys, but there's a big element that aren't. And so uh, it was a great organization to be involved in. You are listening to Off Track with Martin Dwyer and Cornelius Lysett. Andrew Balding and I, before um, Andrew took over from Ian, and Andrew and I used to say in the style of an of a, of a, of a old-fashioned newspaper billboard when it used to say something like, War Declared Shock, or something on billboards that you saw before you bought the evening paper. We used to say, Martin Dwyer has Group One Ride Shock. Uh, yeah, well, that, now that used to get you quite irritated. Yeah, I did. You yeah. Us. yeah. Oh, you weren't laughing over uh, Nottingham. Remember that horse you? <laughs> that horse you owned a share of. What did you remember called? its name? I can. Um, it was called One-Eyed Willie because he had one eye. It was called something party, marching party, drummer party, drummer drumming well, they, party. They called him One-Eyed Willie in the yard. Yeah, because yeah, for one very good reason. Yeah, his eye missing. I rode him around Lingfield. And which eye you can work out if you think of Lingfield, you can work out which eye he must have had missing. 
I can't remember. Because he must have lo he must have not had his left eye, mm. because at Lingfield he, he didn't turn left, he went straight he went on, because yeah. that's all he could see. Yeah. A drumming party, was it? Yeah. Oh, that was his name. Yeah. 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 And you owned a share in him. I owned a bit Andrew of him. Andrew trained him. He ran off the bend with me at Lingfield, like you said, nearly went through the rail into the crowd. So next time out, I didn't ride him, I refused to ride him. Mm. And Missy, uh, Andrew's grandmother, who was a formidable lady called Mrs. Hastings, um, uh, she um, she was not impressed that you didn't, uh, <laughs> no. that you wouldn't ride. Because <laughs> no. you were sort of, were you, uh, you were sort of stable jockey, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, I was at the time, yeah. Priscilla Hastings, when, when the news was broken. She was an Everton fan. Was she? Yes, did well, she you came, she, she, Her family came from, her family came from Liverpool, well, sort of. Hastings Bast. Uh, yeah, really? but they, you know where, when I say her family came from Liverpool, sort of. Yeah. Nosley Hall. All oh, right. Yeah. Well. Uh, which allows you, before we go on with Drumming Party, to tell the story about growing up on the States. <laughs> okay. is, that a, is that a true story? The one about Hugh and Hugo Palmer? Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, he wasn't happy about that, was he? Go on, yeah, what, what's some, the story? Somebody asked me, I was riding a few winners for Hugo at the time, and Hugo's a lovely guy, but he's, he's like one of your lot, isn't he? And uh, he wears, you know, orange cords and red socks and <laughs> lots of tweed and speaks very well. But, um, you know, he can get a bit stroppy. And uh, somebody said to me, said to me um, oh, you're getting really well with Hugo. And they were quite surprised. It was a journalist. And I said, thinking we were off the record, I said, well, yeah, me and Hugo, we've got a lot in common. And he was like, yeah, why? I said, well, we both grew up on big estates. <laughs> <laughs> and funny enough, did you not tell me years later that every time you you uh, uh, get a ride for William Haggis, he makes he makes you tell that story yeah, to uh, yeah, he loved that story, lot, didn't he? Haggis. New market trainers enjoyed repeating it to Hugo, poking fun of him. Yeah. But um, but no, it's again goes back to the class thing in, in racing, doesn't it? There is a um, there is a bit of a golfing class where you know us commoners get to meet. You lot and, and mix with you and uh, anyone on. listening to this think you're a chippy little fucker. Well, uh, actually, <laughs> you're, you're, you're no, you're, you really are. I'm just trying the best of my you. Yeah, and you're succeeding <laughs> <laughs> every single, every single. I've heard it so many times before. But uh, dr going back to drumming party, so uh, you'd said that you weren't going to to ride drumming party because it had gone, it had gone straight on rather than turning left as required at, at Lingfield. Practically ended up in the crowd. So we went to Nottingham, and we thought. We definitely win because we didn't. It was a straight mile. It was a straight mile straight at Nottingham, yeah. wasn't it? And so, um, uh, what's the name of the apprentice who uh, rode Neil? Neil Chalmers. Neil Chalmers. We used to call him Judith. You called him what? Judith. Judith Chalmers. <laughs> Did he have lots of holidays as well? No, no, that's a different story. He probably got a holiday after this. <laughs> so, so uh, he Neil rode our horse, drumming party, which yeah. we fancied. And you rode some, I can't remember what yours was called, but you probably can't remember what yours was called. But that's, that's Dean Ivey trained it. Yeah, that's unimportant to the, as far as the story is concerned. So it's a straight mile or straight course, and we win the race. Uh, and in my opinion, we win fair and square. But then, and you are sec you're second, aren't you? Yeah. And, but it's such a ridiculous decision, ultimately when we were thrown rules out rules in your favour. But rules. the stewards didn't have an inquiry until you said, you went and said to them, I think I might object. So they thought they'd better have a second look. But I had to do my best for the owners that were employing me on the day, and that wasn't you. Mm. And the funny thing about it was, it took ages to call the inquiry. <laughs> yeah. And everyone else involved in drumming party had all gone and collected their winnings and had been paid out. But I stayed in the winner's enclosure to sort of glory <laughs> in the fact that we won <laughs> and, and probably to take the piss out of you because we'd beaten you. So I, so me and, um, and Andrew and Ian Kingsclear at the time had um, a good friend of yours, Chad, real name Richard Phillips, but Chad, he, he, who was the travelling head man. He was furious. He didn't speak to me for about four days. And But he and I were the only two who didn't collect. No. But I think he, that's why. That's he, wouldn't, why. he did literally. We, we've been friends for years and he wouldn't speak to me. But your horse came past me with a wet sail, but because he's got one eye, he, he then hung in and ducked in across and hampered me quite severely. You know, I've seen my whole life flash before me. So I obviously had to say that in the steward's room. And that's why they reversed the placings. And I rang Andrew. <laughs> he wasn't happy either, was he? Andrew wasn't there. He wasn't there. So I rang. I said, there is a chance I think we're going to lose this. Don't be ridiculous. I said, well, I think there is a chance. Uh, Dwyer's in full, uh, in full chatty mode. And he, and he said, and that was goodness knows how many years ago now, but I can hear the words ringing in my ear now. If he gets this right race, tell him he's a disloyal little beep. 
<laughs> I think even the uh, even the swear guide on this podcast won't allow me to um, no, it wasn't, to, to, it wasn't to say happy, that. But it, it came back to kick me in the arse because Andrew appealed the decision, so we had to go down to London yeah. to uh, for the appeal. And on the way, that we travelled down together, and uh, me and Andrew decided whoever won, the, you know, if it stood, I'd have to buy lunch, and if he won it, he'd buy lunch. So anyway, it stood, and I. And the lunch cost me more than the prize money, so... Did we not get it in the appeal? No, no. we were never going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, the, the, the chairman of the stewards, and these were the days when y y you couldn't do that. Imagine doing what uh, the story I'm about to tell you now, in uh, nowadays, when the stewarding is... The stewarding has always been serious and, yeah. and always been uh, done well, but nowadays all these professional stewards are so terrified of losing their jobs that they can hardly smile at you, let alone talk to you. Uh, and uh, but the chairman of the stewards that day was in and this was the old-fashioned days when they were probably to, to use a, a Dwyerism they were probably local toffs um, and um, a Dwyerism is that a thing uh, well it's, it's it is now a Dwyerism <laughs> yeah um, uh, it's a half brother to Dwyerism <laughs> but uh, the, your Dwyerism uh, he was probably a, a toff and um, so I was so incensed by the decision that I rang, because it was just before Newmarket, one of the big meetings at Newmarket, so I rang an opticians in Newmarket High Street and I booked him an appointment to have his eyes checked. <laughs> uh, and, and I said to them, uh, I said, I gave my name, and um, I uh, said, I'm terribly forgetful as well. Uh, if I give you my mobile, you wouldn't just ring me up on the morning and just remind me uh, that I'm coming for a, an eye appointment, would you? And, uh, and you gave him his number. I, I gave his number. Anyway, so the following Saturday at Newmarket, I see this guy um, and he said to me, <laughs> it was you! He said, I've been trying to work out who it was all fucking week and it was definitely you, you oh. bastard. Oh, um, really? uh, and uh, anyway, yeah, I remember being... Uh, being you couldn't abs. do that now, could you? No, well, imagine if you did that because the stewarding in those days was three... Um, local, I think they called them local stewards. Oh. What would have been called rather rudely subsequently by various um, uh, BHA are inclined to use the expression now amateur stewards. Mm. And to use the word amateur, well, they gave up their own free time to yeah, do it, didn't but they? But they, they were technically they were amateur, but they weren't amateur because they were non-professional. No. Um, but they were amateur they weren't paid. because they weren't they weren't being paid. Yeah. And that that's quite an important thing about racing. Uh, you, you know, the, 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 there isn't the time to discuss this probably now, but the word amateur in society, amateur means you're not very good at something, you're amateur. Mm. But actually, amateur in racing, and I dare say in other sports as well, what it means is people who love it so much. Yeah, I'm going to give you a Latin lesson. The word Go amateur on. comes from the Latin for I love. A moa mas a mat, a mama a mat, a mant. I love, well I love you love, he, lo he or she loves. We love, you plural love, they love. A moa mas a mat, a mama a mat, a mant. So that word then becomes amateur, and you do it for the love of it. Really? But I think sometimes I in forgot. 20... You forgot. You forgot all that. You forgot your, um, your Latin there, did you? No, I forgot I asked. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you hadn't. <laughs> uh, but um, but uh, do you know, um, uh, na uh, nowadays, I think the, that some people just forget that People, the guy called David Maxwell, who is a very successful businessman, and he rides his own horses in races, mainly amateur races, but mm. also professional races over jumps. And to, to think that he, Sam Whaley Cohen, who won the Grand yeah, National, well, now technically yeah. he's a successful businessman, he loves it, and he's retired now, but he rode in races. And to call Sam Whaley Cohen or David Maxwell amateurs in the way I think that the British Horse Racing Authority nowadays quite likes people to think of that, mm. of, uh, of them. He's, but the, those, he's not an amateur, he rides like a prof he's a professional. Well, well absolutely, Sam, there are lots of, lots of, if you go to a, you know, go to, if you look at an amateur rider's race, obviously there are some people who aren't that good or just getting going, mm. but there are plenty who look, uh, look really decent, but don't want to turn professional for whatever reason in Ireland. Patrick Mullins, uh, who's the champion amateur, he's he's better than most professionals, especially with mm. the practice. But it would mean he couldn't ride in in bumper races or in pointed points. No, it's a good it's a good point. So so mm. you've been a broadcaster, a journalist in racing for 25, 30 years now. I've been a broadcaster for forty one years. Forty one years. Yeah, but but racing Jeez. since nineteen 
87. And I suppose testament, so that's 35 to, testament to that is how high you're held within racing circles in, in such high regard is that picture at Royal Ascot. <laughs> Oh, the picture at Royal Ascot. Now here's the ultimate. Here is the ultimate. Oh, I'd forgotten about that picture. Here is the we have to ultimate. Have to explain for in yeah, case anybody to, listening to this. Yeah, I'm going to explain the ultimate insult. That um, in the in the pandemic Royal Ascot of 2021 was it? Uh, well, or it could have been 22. It could have been both actually. It could have been both times. Um, the jockeys, so so what happened with the changing room, they had to expand the changing rooms yeah, to give we you were, enough space, didn't they? We got they? changed in a bar down near the uh, near the bandstand, that's where we were. And near this bar, near the bandstand... Was a toilet, we, public we, toilet. And you went in there in order to do whatever. and To wash my goggles. To wash your goggles, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> to wash, that's another Dwyerism. <laughs> <laughs> we could, we, I'm going to get onto the Oxford English Dictionary later on. This could be a new phrase for the uh, Dwyerism. Um, but, um, uh, and so you're standing there doing your whatever in the, in the gents. You look up and there is a photograph directly <laughs> above the, the urinals. In, in front of the urinals. And what was the picture? Picture of you. Yeah, I know. Picture of you in, your, in all your... Uh, Top hat and tails. You, yeah, you look very smart, and and you know they say sometimes, very much like the Mona Lisa. You know, <laughs> a picture has to be in place, and what you a thought it was in the right place. In the right place. Yeah, a shit house next to the. <laughs> and you did not like that. I couldn't. Oh, great! I had to go and get my phone, and take yeah, a picture of it. Uh, absolutely, you practically got practically got arrested by the official who said you're not allowed to take your phone. Yeah. I've got an important. I've got my phone into the toilet. <laughs> Yeah, you didn't like that, did you? Uh, that was well. No, it's 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 a it's a sort of. It's it, a shame this is a podcast. It'd, it'd be great to get that picture out there. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I'm, it, not, um, I'm not sure. I still have ne it. Ne well, you know, technically we are being filmed. <laughs> uh, ne next time you go to Ascot, go to. You, you, yeah. no, we're gonna we're gonna start people trawling through the gents. People are gonna go to Ascot, yeah. Royal Ascot this year. Normally be heading to the bandstand and then trying to find the nearest loo. Uh, find you. Uh, uh, and uh, but funnily enough, normally when people in a, go in a loo near you, <laughs> <laughs> well, at least uh, that that would be compared to some of the things you hear that you can find in racecourse loos. To be honest, that picture would be pretty harmless. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, that gosh, we've we've got we've we've sort of gone quite a long way, haven't we? We've got we've rambled around the. Um, have we rambled around the houses? Mm, we've, probably. We've, we've gone about as quickly as some of the horses you ride these days. They're getting slower these days. <laughs> You are listening to Off Track with Martin Dwyer and Cornelius Lysett. Certainly as a member of the media, I definitely used to sit there and think, uh, and I remember the late Alan Lee, who was racing correspondent mm. at the Times, we used to say, it, stand there and it was our sort of ritual before a race and say, what do we want to win this? Which basically means what's the best story. Uh, well, and, who are you going to get the best uh, Are you going to get the, and you know, who's going to be the f most fun story to tell? Mm. Um, and the and the easiest story to tell because they tend to be they tend to go hand in hand and you do sometimes look at some of the people involved and think do I really want that horse to win because God the owner's boring the trainer's boring the jockey's boring um, and then you say gosh that would be fantastic if well and I suspect when people looked at the one thousand guineas ahead of the um, ahead of the of the uh, of the race people probably thought. Oh, George Bowie. That would be yeah. that would be that would be good. A guy who's thirty years old, just who who's who's um, only in his is he in his second full season? I think he had some... his first pattern winner the year before of that meeting, didn't he? And he he had, the, but he, he uh, everyone talks obviously is going to talk about the thousand guineas, but he was second in the uh, in the Oaks, was it last year? Mm, I think. Yeah, he yeah. Was, yeah. So so he's um, had a Breeders' Cup runner, didn't he? He had a Breeders' Cup runner, but but so people were thinking, you know, and he is. A, bit of a character because he's younger and fresher and different uh, and then that combined with James Doyle who who mm. wears his heart on his sleeve and tends to say when I say he says what he thinks he he he, he says what he thinks he, he I'm not saying that he says the wrong things because he doesn't say the wrong things but he says some interesting things and the owners that you know they're a they're a syndicate yeah. um, uh, which um, uh, which um, you know that's that's good and important these days as well well James I think he was quite uh you could see he was he was genuinely emotional. He's he's won quite a lot of big races around the world, and he's he's, he's been incredibly successful. But he but hasn't got a British classic no, until then, first, has he? First yeah. classic, and then he has his second classic the next yeah, day, which, which is was, extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, um, but yeah, he. I remember a time when he talked about packing up. He actually took a plumbing course. Yeah, absolutely. Which and, uh, uh, I remember, I got a lift with him to the races, and his car. We barely barely got to Windsor. 
mm. and his car was falling apart and, and mm. <laughs> he said he couldn't afford to fix it so I rang a friend of mine who fixed it for him really yeah and he paid it so on you the can the reflecting glory of james doyle without you he might have got got to that point so effectively really I, I, i've got a hand in winning both guineas this year yeah and and, <laughs> and are you going to mention it you certainly are, <laughs> are you, you, so, yeah and maybe you ought to invoice james for uh, for that work that um, i don't think he paid for the car so yeah maybe yeah. <laughs> but no that it is that's the good thing about racing that's yeah, and I don't want to be and I, I think that everyone needs to buy in because the fact is if the public wasn't there to support racing mm. to bet on racing and to go to the races and to support racing uh, then we wouldn't be able to compete for the prize money that everyone's competing for so therefore when you get a an owner or a trainer or a jockey who is a bit standoffish a bit reluctant I think they have to think actually you the, the public need to get to know a little bit about these guys because actually if they don't then they're not going to continue to support it in which case they won't continue to bet there won't be so much money from there they won't continue to go to the races there won't be so much money from there they won't continue to buy television subscriptions as well um, and so again there won't be money around the place so, although you know you hear of a trainer's shy an owner's shy a jockey's shy or doesn't like doing it or whatever but I, I think they need to I think they do need to buy into it mm. because I'm a, I'm a bit shy maybe I should be a bit more outgoing yeah well maybe you should be there's another dryerism <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what about our wonderful football team before we finish this uh, yeah. podcast what do we think are we hopeful of staying up because you were a QPR fan when I first met you well I'm a bit I'm a bit embarrassed because I'm a complete con man really uh, that, that's, uh, that, if I bowl them up Martin you hit them I'm a complete <laughs> con man really yeah, we do know that. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I used to live in London, and I used to live r within spitting distance of, um, of QPR, of Loftus Road. We went, didn't we? Did we go one we time? Yeah, a long time That's ago what, now. And then I yeah. converted, yeah. And then, do you know, I, I was never a football fan. I was a fan of QPR because they were on the doorstep. And then uh, the, there was a person who worked at the BBC, very good friend of mine, continues to be a good friend, and he said, why don't you, why don't you come one time? And it was it was lower end Premier League stuff. I think he says it wasn't Bolton, but I think we were playing Bolton, and I think we were both safe, fifteenth and sixteenth. And it was rubbish. And it was rubbish, yeah. uh, according to him. But I went, and this is what I can't get over with football, is I don't really understand. I I never sort of played properly or anything like that, even in the playground. But uh, but what I loved is that you go to the races. There are seven races, and you get a big high or hopefully get a high mm. at the end of every race, and maybe a couple of shocks during a race, during a jump race. But with the football, you sit at Goodison Park, um, and Mark Sharman, followed by Martin Dwyer, got me into uh, following Everton. Uh, and you sit there, and over 90 minutes, you're up there, you're down there, you're up there, and you can be up there and down there within, te well, at, at Goodison, within about five seconds. Um, and uh, so I, I absolutely love it. I might say, this is before David Moyes came in, before Wayne Rooney, mm -hmm. you said to me one time, they say there's a kid at, uh, yeah. at the academy called Wayne Rooney. A good, um, a good friend of mine, Andy Holden, coached him. And he told me this kid coming through, and he wasn't wrong. He was, you know, some player. Memory scored against Arsenal when he was 17. Yeah, and wasn't that? And the, do you remember there was a great goal against Leeds when he was, uh, you know, the skill. He it was, oh no, it can't have been against Leeds because they wouldn't have been in they the Premier League. Premier but League. It, it was probably against. It's probably the Arsenal goal you're thinking of. Yeah, no, that's. I've just proved what a con man I am. Yeah. Um, but if that's I was a real con man, I wouldn't have corrected the fact well, that it couldn't have been Leeds. Well, my uncle John, who lives. A stone throw away from Goodison. He he still tells a story about he went the match with, and you kept calling Tim Cale Timothy. No, that, that <laughs> is an Tim. untrue story. No, it's not. There is another Dwyer in your Timothy. family who's, Go on, who's Timothy. Uh, anyway, the, the, uh, amongst the many great things about your uncle John is that he's got parking right outside his house, <laughs> which is very very useful if you don't fancy going all the way over to Sefton Park. Yeah, but for a um, yeah, well let let's keep our fingers crossed about Everton. Yeah, let's hope we stay uh, up. Uh, let's let's hope we do. Uh, I think I think Leeds could be in peril. Burnley aren't safe. Two or three others could be dragged into it yet. So well, um, you know, come on, Frank. Let's hope, Super Frank, Super Frank. Do you think we've got more chance of staying up or more chance of this podcast being successful? The end. <laughs> So this has been the Off Track Podcast with Martin Dwyer and Cornelius Lysis. 
Um, hopefully, uh, we'll be back again to discuss further matters, reminisce further over uh, both of our careers as riders. There's a, a whole, there's a whole cellar full of stories. Um, and if you've enjoyed it, um, and if you fancy it, um, why don't you uh, perhaps subscribe, or perhaps like us as well, and we'll see you very soon. You've been listening to Off Track with Martin Dwyer and Cornelius Lysett.